begin your broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, let's do a little, uh, not a little. Oh, sounds good already. Fantastic. Oh, cool. All right, let me get into character. Got to take care of a little tiny bit of housekeeping real quick. And then we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 5th, 2018. This is the week and trucks. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and boy, I'm not going to have a lot to say about that. And I have a lot to kind of build up to before we get to that, which will hopefully help to make a lot of sense when we get to the actual live charts. And that's especially true for those who aren't familiar with the methodology. For those of you who are familiar with the methodology, you might go get a cup of coffee, but I think there's some relevant things that are gonna be discussed. Anyway, what I'm getting to is this week's focus was is when the trend ends and a new one begins. And I think now's a very, very timely time to do this, especially since we've been in such a long-term bull market. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. And I think that, boy, it's it's really rewarded a lot of bad behavior. Now, I was looking at trades from 2018, I'm sorry, 17, and without discretion, a lot of the trades would not have taken off. And here's the deal. If you would have not used stops, you would have probably printed money on nearly all of these trades. But you got to be careful because sometimes the market is a really bad teacher. And I'll have a few more things to say about that as we get further in. And I do want to obviously recap on the Dave Light situation and do a bear market update. Before we do all that, there's the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, before we get started on trend transitions, meaning the trend has begun to trade uh, change and you're looking to trade that new change in trend, what I would strongly urge you to do is learn how to trade established trends first. So if you're not well-versed in trading trends and experienced with trading something like, let's say, pullbacks or something simple like persistent pullbacks or trend knockouts and patterns like that, then get become successful trading those first before looking to venture out into transitions. Now, if you're not thinking about trading transitions, you're still sort of back in that trend resumption mode, learning how to trade pullbacks or TKOs or persistent pullbacks or whatever. It's probably a good idea to begin learning about these patterns just so it will help you to recognize when the old trend may be coming to an end. Now, when the trend appears to be turning, you don't want to micromanage yourself out of existing positions. So if you had a great looking long setup and it's beginning to look, it's beginning to pull back a little bit with the overall market. You don't necessarily want to bail out on that. You want to continue to follow the plan because sometimes, and sometimes be the key word in that sentence, sometimes you just get a little correction in a stock and then it goes on and continues on to make new highs in spite of the overall market. Remember, without getting into too many details, our job or our ultimate goal is to catch the so-called black swan event. We actually want to be on the right side of the black swan and trend following and catch that longer term trend or longer term melt up or whatever the case may be. So don't exit just because the overall market is starting to look a little iffy. But you do want to become super duper selective on anything new and then begin considering potential emerging trends. So if you see a short or two setting up, start to consider some shorts. If we have time, I'll elaborate a little bit on too short or not too short, which I've covered in the past. 
the great thing about if you're recognizing these transitional patterns as they begin to set up, it'll keep you from fighting the last war. And we've all been guilty of that at some point in time. You get in these, let's say like 1999, you get in a rip roaring bull market, you just don't want it to end. And my first, uh, my first foray into that was, I remember many, many years ago, uh, somebody where I worked said, oh man, I put, all, I put all my 401k into this foreign fund that's available. And I made 123% last year. And then I just, so I piled in at the beginning of the year and um, it failed miserably. So sometimes great trends, or I, I should say even great trends do come to an end. Now keep in mind that when you're trading a transitional type of pattern, in other words, a new trend, emerging trend type of pattern. Oh, I'm using the wrong microphone. Let's change mics here. Okay. Uh, hopefully the mic just got a little better. I'll have to mention that maybe. So we're not trying to outsmart the, smart the market, but rather we're paying attention to a potential change in tie. And what's the old saying? A rising tide lifts all egos and a rising tide lifts all boats. When it comes to the markets, it makes everybody feel like they're a genius. Well, just like a rising tide lifts all ships, you got to think about it, about it from the opposite side. A falling tide will sink all ships. Now, you might be thinking, oh, hey, hey, Dave, what about using relative strength in a bear market? Well, I covered that quite a bit in the layman's guide to trading stocks, which you can find on my website. And then if you email me, I'll even tell you, get on my newsletter and you can even get it free if you do that. But before we, uh, before I digress too far, what I talked about in the book was that there's an old Wall Street adage. And sometimes these people who scream on TV or are guilty of it saying, oh, there's always a bull market somewhere. I would know there's not always a bull market somewhere. Sometimes all stocks go down. And anyway, I covered that not to beat the dead horse or I'm sorry, not to get be redundant, but I covered that in detail in layman's. Just a quick thought, and I think this came out of trading full circle. And this is why you want to learn how to trade trend transitions or certainly at least learn to recognize them and certainly use protective stops if you're going to be more of a buy and hold type of person. Obviously, in 2008, the majority of mutual fund managers were down 50% by mid-year, and that's just like the market itself. So the average fund manager was down over 50%. So don't be average. Pay attention to these patterns. And learn to recognize when a market is making a turn. Now, keep in mind that you are going to be a pioneer when you're trading new trends. Sometimes, and I'll explain this in some detail in a few minutes when trying to determine whether or not it's a new trend or not, sometimes you will be fighting what is what, what will later turn out to only be a correction in the longer term prior trend. In other words, that prior trend is still in place. So you will be a bit of a pioneer, and like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the arrows or the gold. But the way I see it, the chance of the gold makes it all worthwhile. But again, you want to learn how to trade established trends first. Now, let's define what a trend transition is. We are not, let me repeat, we are not trying to catch a top in a market and we're not trying to catch a bottom. That's a very bad way to trade. Fighting, that's fighting trends, okay? We're not trying to say, oh, it's topped here, or even that it's topped here, okay? But what we are doing is if we see that that trend begins to lose momentum, and then quite possibly a new trend begins to emerge, then we're looking to short that market on the first sides, signs of a correction. Conversely, if we see a market in a downtrend begin to bottom out, we're not going to try to buy it because it's bottoming out or it seems cheap. But what we are going to do is if we see some sort of sign that the trend may be turning, we will look to get long on the first correction. Now, just real quick, and this is just kind of a thumbnail sketch of trading 
transitions today. Obviously, it would take a little bit more time to cover them all than we, we have time today. But a couple little things. One, the reason I say the first correction is we're not waiting for a nice deep pullback because sometimes a market will only make a little tiny correction and then take off. And this catches the most amount of people off guard. For instance, on the short side, market begins to roll over, has a little bit of a bounce. Well, everybody who is long from back here, okay, they're happy back here. And then all of a sudden, they begin losing money. So they're thinking, okay, well, it's beginning to bounce. I'm just going to let it go back to new highs. And then once again, I'll be happy like I have been since 2009. And if it only rallies up a little bit and then begins to sell off, then they're in a world of hurt. Now, without going too deep into the psychology of the players, keep in mind that most players aren't going to bail out right in here when that market begins to drop. They're going to bail out further down the line, okay, when it starts to put some pressure on them. Maybe they have some money saved up for juniors, Ivy League school, and then all of a sudden the market begins to tank. And all of a sudden it's going to be like, well, I'm not quite an Ivy League school. And then before you know it, it's going to be junior college. <laughs> and not that I'm laughing that that because that's a sad thing to, to happen. But you want to be able to still send your kid to a decent school. So at some point you might pull the plug. As Mary McClellan once said, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And other people and others use far more sophisticated methods. Now, keep in mind when it comes to tops and bottoms, Sometimes they're a process and sometimes they're an event. Sometimes the market just gradually rolls over, which we might be in right now, might be in a keyword in that sentence, and sometimes it tends to crash a little bit. What's fascinating, as I will flesh out a little bit, and I've been talking about it over the last several weeks, is that you would think that market tops or events, like a market crash, okay, and you would think that bottoms are more of a process. But as a general statement, it's just the opposite. I learned that from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. And if I had to give anybody credit, it probably was from Greg Morris. So it's, it's, it's kind of it kind of turns everything on its head a little bit. And as I've said in prior weeks, since the market's become a little iffy in here, if you go back and study even some of the crashes of the market, you'll see that a lot of times that market slowed down and sort of going sideways to lower for a long, long time. And the beauty of that is if you are using stops, which I'll reiterate towards the end of this presentation, then more than likely you would have gotten stopped out of your positions long before that so-called crash or that actual crash happened. In fact, what's kind of fast fascinating is in 2008, the S&P actually did most of its rolling over in 2007. And everybody talks about it like it was this big tragic thing. And I'm like, what was so tragic about it? The market kind of gradually rolled over. We had a weekly bow tie. It's like you could see it coming from a mile away. And I'm not saying that in hindsight. We go back in, in and look at the archives. We started shorting in October, November 2007. And I know I say this every week, or most every week. I had to apologize to my clients. I can't find any logs. I know the market's making new highs, but I can't find any logs to save my life. Here's a short. Let's give it a shot, see what happens. Oh, here's another one. Let's give it a shot, see what happens. And then the market, of course, began to roll over in earnest. Now, again, sometimes you have a V shaped recovery. And again, believe it or not, bottoms are often V-shaped type recoveries. The bottom in 2009 was a bit of a more V-shaped recovery. Now, let's talk about first thrust. First thrust or a transitional pattern that occurs that is a bit more of an event. You get a thrust in the new direction of the trend. So let's just walk through this. Now, this is a buy side setup. The first thing you want to look for with the first thrust is a major low. 
Now, major load depends on your time frame. But on a daily chart, I like to see a yearly low or a, ideally a multi-year low on a chart. And that means that the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market or the most amount of people have the same opinion about the market. And then you're looking for a sharp first thrust higher. Now, sharp is a bit arbitrary, and I'll flesh out a few things here in just a minute to help you with that. But the bottom line is that's relative to the market. As you'll see in a few slides, it's like banks versus biotech. Okay, well, a four-point move in a bank might be a pretty serious move. That might be more than it moves over several weeks. So that's a legitimate first thrust, whereas a biotech might move four points in one afternoon, in one hour even, maybe. So that's not quite as significant. And again, I'll flesh that out in just a minute or two. Now we're looking for a pullback. And a pullback is defined as a one-bar pullback at least. A lower high and a lower low. Now keep in mind, in some cases, you might just get a lower low. It's a little bit more advanced, but sometimes you might have, let's say like this was your first thrust here, and then you had a lower low here, but it didn't quite take out, I'm sorry, a lower high. It didn't quite take out the bottom of that bar. So that's a little bit more advanced, but for purposes of today's, let's focus on those that make a lower high and a lower low. In other words, a one bar pullback. Now I purposely drew this in really tiny because again, we're not waiting for that big, nice longer term pullback or trend knockout move or whatever. We're looking for the first little signs of correction and we're looking to get long if and only if that trend begins to resume. Now, obviously there's a danger in that, okay? Again, you could be this major longer term trend might still be in place, okay? And the other thing is it might just have a little bit of anemic bounce and then die in earnest again as that longer term downtrend remains. So you are a bit of a pioneer. But if it does begin to take off in earnest, then you're going to get in early while everybody else, the long players, potential long players, might be waiting for that deeper pullback. And they're going to be forced to put up a shut up. And the shorts who refuse to believe that the market is going to go higher, shorts have a bit of a bigger ego than the longs. And I don't know why that is. But eventually they're going to have to throw in the towel and buy. And they may, they too might be waiting for that little first correction here at point three on this chart. They might be waiting for this to turn into something much bigger to vindicate them or keep them vindicated in their position. So looking at an actual trade, we had a major low, a sharp thrust from lows, your first little pullback. Now keep in mind that your your setup was actually complete right here on this first little bar down. But fortunately, we did have a little bit of a deeper pullback, which made it nice. And the reason that's fortunate is, one, the correction shakes out some people who may have bottom fished or gotten in early. It also gives you the potential for a reversion to the mean move. Now, remember, let me bring up a blank chart here, a blank uh, thing. Let's see if I can move this somewhere else. Now, keep in mind that if you're trading a pullback, there's a chance that, let's say you get it here, there's a chance that you're going to get that reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. That's just a generic pullback or a TKO move or something like that. Whereas if you're trading a transition off of major lows and you're trading that first little correction, you don't have the luxury of that reversion to the mean move. So that's one strike against you. And that's one reason why they're going to be slightly less accurate than trading something in an established trend, trading a trend resumption type of pattern. Now let's talk about the first thrust on the short side, just the opposite of the buy side. You have a major new high. You have a sharp thrust lower. And when we get to the, the charts, if somebody reminds me, I'll show you a first thrust that recently happened in a NASDAQ followed by a bow tie. But you, again, you're waiting for that first little pullback, and then you're looking to short if and only if it triggers an entry. 
So if you take a look at this example, you can see this stock made an all-time high, and then it made a nice thrust lower. Now, in a minute, I'm going to walk you through a few tips and tricks on determining whether or not it's a first thrust. And as I said a second ago, one of those things is what's the volatility of the underlying market? Again, a four-point move in a bank is, could be very significant, would likely be significant, whereas a four-point move in a biotech might not. Well, here you had a fairly substantial move lower. You also had some clues, and these clues I call trend qualifiers. You had a gap down. You had a wide-range bar down. And I don't remember. I took a lot of these slides from Trading Full Circle, so I'm not sure if I grabbed some of the slides that showed a deceleration in momentum. But you also had a deceleration in momentum if you look at things on a net net basis. Okay. So you can see, and you can't see it over here, but this market was in a super duper longer term uptrend. Everybody and their brother loved this stock, and then it began to implode. So again, once you have that established thrust lower, rule number two, you're looking for, in this case, a one bar pullback, a higher high and a lower. This should be a higher low, actually. Sorry about that. Higher high and a higher low. We'll edit that out. Okay. So that's legitimately the setup right here. You might give it a little bit of wiggle room as we did. And in a case like this, it actually continued to pull back, which is fine. I prefer them to actually pull back, but you have to be willing to jump in right here with maybe a little bit of wiggle room as opposed to sitting around waiting for that pullback. Now, in this particular case, here's the bank that I was referring to, and you could see maybe a five-point drop from here to here. Okay, that's let's just say 10% round numbers. That's not that big of a deal in a biotech. I could think of cases where we had 20% move in one morning, right? But in a bank, that's a pretty big deal. And notice that you're at an all-time high here. Notice that you began to lose some steam, okay? So you can see the clues are beginning to stack up a little bit on this one when you had that thrust lower. Also, if I back this out, you can see right here, I'm just remembering this now, this one had a gap down after all-time highs. That's also a little bit more advanced strategy, but something I call a reverse, reverse gap strategy, where you look for a gap within 10 days of an all-time high. In this particular case, close enough to this all-time high. You had the gap down, you look for a pullback after. So that's kind of cool that that sets up, with, up within the first thrust. I'm just noticing that. And then again, we look to play the pullback. Now this was your one bar pullback here, but notice that it did continue to pull back, which makes it kind of nice because you will get a little bit of that reversion to the mean move. And then you enter if and only if it, it triggers an entry. In other words, if it takes out the low of the pullback. Now, the question is, and I, I was supposed to cover this last week. My apologies. Somebody emailed me and I promised I covered it and I totally forgot. But the question is, is it a pullback or is it a transition? Well, the answer is, it depends. Sometimes there's an obvious pullback. So if you've got a market in a super duper great trend and you see a move that looks like this, it's like, OK, well, that's pretty obvious. It's just correcting a little bit in here and probably just a correction. Now, sometimes you see a market that's in an obvious transition where you've got a nice uptrend. But you're like, well, hang on. This thing is beginning to implode. This looks pretty darn ugly. And I've got a few things I'll mention on, on how do you know in one second. And this is a bit of a dilemma. When you have a deep pullback, it's either going to be the beginnings of a transition and it's going to continue lower or it's going to turn back up and take off. Now, I like trading deep pullbacks on the long side because you get a really nice pop if it does begin to take off in, in the direction of the trend. But if you do see something in a deep pullback like this if i can make my chart work i don't think it's gonna let me do it oh there it is okay so if you do see a deep pullback like this sometimes it'll just kind of crawl up a little bit and it won't take off sometimes that could be your clue 
that that deep pullback is the beginning of a transition, okay? And sometimes if you get something in between this and this, it's what I call a micro first thrust. It's like your, your thrust is significant, but it's not huge, and you know that it's going to be a little bit more dangerous to go in. It's like a pioneer of the pioneer setup. Now, one thing you could do, let's say you're playing a deep pullback. What you could do, instead of trying to enter down here in more of a quote-unquote textbook fashion, you could give it a little bit of wiggle room just in case, like I just said, it begins to rally up but doesn't quite get there, okay? It doesn't happen often, but every now and then you'll see, and this, this I know it confuses the new guys and girls, but every now and then you might see a long on the trading service that doesn't trigger but pulls back like this. And then you'll see it as a short a few days later. Okay. So sometimes you reach that inflection point where it's either deep pullback and it's going to resume or it's a the beginnings of a new transition. And it can be at an inflection point. One thing you can do to help determine if it's at an inflection point or not is check on the net net. Yes, it might be in a great uptrend if you go way back in time. But as Janet Jackson says, what have you done for me lately? Notice to see if it's lost some steam when it possibly made its new high. Okay. And then also notice on a net-net basis how far back in time has it traded. And let's say you do have some trading in here. You have some overhead supply. Has it broken down below that overhead supply? That's another one of those things you want to look for. So when it comes to a pullback versus a transition, you want to study the volatility from both a statistical standpoint. I like to use historical volatility. Okay and a common sense standpoint. So, again, banks versus biotechs, a bank is going to, as a general statement, is going to have a lot lower volatility than something like a biotech. Banks you can quantify with earnings, and there's ways to quantify them. Not that, you, not that I want to, but fundamentals make a little bit more sense. I know I just said the F word. In something like banks than they do in something like a biotech. One of my biggest litmus tests, let's say you're looking at a trend knockout or something, or even better, you're looking at, or as good, I should say, you're looking at a transition, trying to figure it out. Is it a transition? Is it a deep pullback? Ask yourself if you would have gotten stopped out of that position, assuming that you had made the transition into the longer term trader. And that can be a good litmus test, just relative. Look at the charts relative to your own trading. Now, if you're, you can't look at the chart and say, oh, well, I like to use a really tight stop, 5% stop, 8% stop, whatever. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything because you're not adjusting to the volatility of the market. But if you were adjusting to the volatility of the market to begin with, and you have a really wide stop on a biotech, and that stop would have gotten taken out, then you know, okay, I get it. That's more than just a pullback. That's likely the beginning of a first thrust. And then again, you want to look for some trend qualifiers against the trend. By the way, when it comes to a setup, as I often preach, if you have, unless it's a commodity or something, let's say a stock's rallying up, it's like, oh, it looks great. Oh, it's pulling back. If there's a gap in that pullback, okay, I would not take the setup. Now, if it's a small gap in a commodity-related stock, then maybe, okay, or a small gap in a very volatile stock, then maybe. But as a general statement, you don't want to go long a stock that's gapping to the downside. However, if it is gapping to the downside, then you know that it could be a legitimate first thrust lower. Now, here's the other thing, too. Although you should look for first thrust first, stay with me. I have a slide on that. 
If you are new to playing transitions, then consider waiting for Landry's bow tie. There's always a trade-off in trading. If you're waiting for a bow tie, which we'll get into in just one second, okay, it may take a while for that bow tie to form. The beauty is, let's say that market goes on the new highs, then no capital is put in harm's way. The negative or the trade-off of the trade would be that if you wait for this, it might sell off long before this bow tie forms. And I'll give an example of that in just one second. But if you're newer to transitions, yes, waiting for that confirmation and being willing to let one go every now and then will help you out. Because the bow tie is a more defined signal. You can actually, and I have the code I'll give you, Somebody, one of my clients wrote it for TradeStation. I'm sorry, for, it probably would translate to TradeStation easily, for Telechart. And I haven't used it in a while, but a, but a few years back, there was a hedge fund manager. And he was doing his own thing, which didn't involve trends. But his clients were beating him up because the S&P was going up and he wasn't making money. Well, his system had nothing to do with the benchmark to the S&P, but he sort of caved in. And asked me if I would help him out and maybe uh, he liked bow ties. So what I would do is I'd give him bow tie setup. So anyway, I used that code that somebody wrote and it worked out pretty good. Long story endless. Um, the new meta stock that's coming out has bow ties in it. So you can uh, use that. And that'll be out in about another month. Now, I call it a bow tie because it looks like a bow tie when the moving averages come together and spread out. I use a 10-day simple, a 20-day exponential, and a 30-day exponential. And you're looking for those to come together and spread out. You want to see the market go from 30 greater than 20 greater than 10 to 10 greater than 20 greater than 30. You want to see them flip over. 30, 20, 10. 10, 20, 30. Now, before we pick apart the bow tie, you have to view indicators as illustrators. I see people buy my indicator. It indicates that it indicates the market's going to turn. No, it doesn't. It's a leading indicator. No, no, it doesn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> it indicates what the market will do next. No, it doesn't. <laughs> An indicator indicates what has happened. It doesn't indicate anything. So I like to see them as illustrators and not indicators. Price is the ultimate oscillator. Unless you're Bill Clinton, as I preach, what is, is. Any indicator derived from price and any price-based indicator is a derivative of price. Duh. So any indicator derived from price does not predict. An indicator simply illustrates what's already there. So I would strongly urge you to learn how to trade and learn how to read blank charts long before you plot a moving average, an oscillator, or any other indicator so let's take a look at this market here you can see that it's in a pretty serious uptrend there's no arguing that now let's put the moving averages in well when you put the moving averages in you're like well hold on dave the 10-day simples turned down the 20-day exponentials turned down and the 30-day exponentials turned down this market looks like it might be rolling over. Well, yeah, but if you just look at the net net price change, you'll see that, hey, where are we now? Where were we a month and change ago? And also, look at the net net up here. It went sideways for about three weeks, just eyeballing it. So, yeah, moving averages can be useful, but they, and any other indicator for that matter, do not indicate anything 
other than what's already happened. And also, I'm just noticing right now, there's a little gap here, okay? So the moving average didn't indicate the gap, but it helps to illustrate that there's a gap in the chart. So something might be wrong when these moving averages begin to turn down, and especially when they begin to cross over. And that's especially true after new highs. Now, the reason I use a 10-day simple is I like to get a true moving average to give me a true representation of range. I also, and this is just by complete accident and empirical research, in other words, looking at a lot of charts, I also found that I like the interaction between the 20 to 30 and the 10 day simple, the 20 exponential, 30 exponential, and the 10 day simple. I've met many people in my travel who use, who love bow ties, but they put their own little moving averages in there for whatever reason. This is what I, and people like to go put their own little layer on things, and that's fine, tweak things a little bit. But for me, I just like these, the 10, the 20, and 30. So again, notice the 10s below the 20 and the 20s below the 30. And then they come together at what I call a fulcrum point. And the 10 is then greater than the 20 and the 20 is then greater than 30. So just FYI, 20 trading days, that's roughly a month's worth of trading. And 30 trading days is roughly six weeks worth of trading. So let's take a look at an example. You can see 30 is greater than 20, greater than the 10. And they come together at what I call the fulcrum. And the tighter of the fulcrum, the better. Usually over three to four bars would be a good rule of thumb for that. Sometimes a little more. I like the ones that can do it at three bars. In other words, you start counting. As soon as you get your first cross, which would be on this day here, the one. So this happened within like three days. As soon as one moving average crosses the other, that's when your count begins. And then your count ends when they all have gone from uptrend proper order to downtrend proper order. So here, you're in downtrend proper order still, even though it doesn't look like it a downtrend because the market is beginning to rally. But this is actually a longer term downtrend. So if you back this chart way out, it just looks like this, okay? But you can see this would not count as this would not count as day one until it began to cross. So this would be day one and then day two. In this particular case, it took two days to cross. So that's a pretty tight bow tie. And then again, like the first thrust, we're looking for a one bar pullback, just a one bar pullback, and looking to get long if and only if the trend begins to resume. So here's the actual rules. It's easier to just show you in the chart. 10 less than 20, less than 30. 20 greater than 10 greater than 20 greater than 30. Easy for me to say. Over a period of short period of time, ideally three to four, four days. And then I put our periods in here. Because as you'll see in one second, sometimes we might be looking at a weekly chart. Sometimes we might be looking at a daily chart. Sometimes we might be looking at an hourly chart. And if you really want to hurt your eyes and make too many damn trading decisions and go crazy, you could look at a one-minute chart. I'd recommend that you don't. And then again, a one-bar pullback, and you look to enter after the pullback. So here's another example. In this particular case, very, very, very long, long, long-term downtrend. And then the market begins to bottom out. And notice that the moving averages, when they finally, when the price finally begins to rally up, the moving averages cross over. This one took a little bit longer. This one took about four days across, but still, it's tight enough to where it still looks like a bow tie. Okay, you still have that fulcrum in the middle. And then also in a case like this too, and again based on the volatility of the stock. If this measures out as a first thrust, and then the bow tie just kind of confirms what you're seeing. And then also, once again, I'm just noting this is why I like to teach, because I, I notice things as I teach. But notice right here, what do we have? We had a little gap off of all-time lows, off a bit of a, a tiny triple bottom. So that was a clue. I don't want to necessarily try to buy it right here. 
But that's like an aha moment, like, okay, we got a bow tie. Oh, well, look at that. We got a little gap. We have a wide range bar higher. Notice the size of these bars, okay? For the most part, this is not super duper volatile in here. And then notice the size of this bar relative to these bars and even these bars here, much, much, much bigger. So we have what's called a wide range bar higher. We also have a strong close, meaning that it closes the top of its range. Same thing happened here. Same thing happened here, happened here, happened here. We also have, you gotta squint your eyes. My drawing kind of interferes with it. We also have another gap higher. So what do we have? We have a lot of trend qualifiers in the direction of trend. This would qualify also as a first thrust. And then we have a bow tie to back it up. So even if you didn't, if you weren't sure whether or not that thrust was big enough to qualify as a first thrust, your bow tie confirmed that it was a bottom. Now, the bow tie won't always catch up this fast, but the bow ties are wonderful when it's more of a process type of bottom versus an event. And once again, we're looking for a one bar pullback, and the trigger is when or if that trend begins to resume, that new trend begins to resume. Now, you want to look for first thrust first. So if you have a sharp thrust lower like we have here, you would look to enter this stock when the first thrust triggers and not wait around for the bow tie because the bow tie forms later. In the prior example, the bow tie formed at the same time, which is great. There's no question whether or not it's a potential bottom if they both happen at the same time. But sometimes you get the first thrust first, so you want to take that first thrust and not sit around and wait for a bow tie to form. Now, the caveat is, as I said earlier, if you're newer to trading these new trends, these transitions and trends, then what you want to do is you want to wait for the bow tie, just the opposite of what I just got through saying. That way you have that confirm confirmation. Start trading the bow ties first, wrap your head around it, get good at it, and then go back or go and, and learn the first thrust or begin to try to recognize those first thrust patterns and gradually ease yourself into those. By the way, I think, you know, every, every week or every day when I write whatever I write, I'm like, uh, there's no secret to trading. And it's like, and then the next, I begin writing is like, well, and another secret to trading. But another secret to trading would be find one pattern, trade it until you become successful, consistently trading it. And as I mentioned earlier, persistent pullbacks would probably be a good pattern or TKOs or ideally persistent pullbacks combined with TKOs would be a great pattern to trade. Once you get successful at that, then start, start adding on other patterns. So when you're starting to look to, Trade transitions, trade bow ties first. Get used to trading bow ties, get good at trading bow ties, become successful at trading bow ties, and then move on to first thrust and then possibly something like reversal gap strategy or some of those other transitional patterns that I have. Now, as I often preach, and, and I get asked this question quite a lot, one day I'm going to get around to getting writing a fact page, and probably every time somebody asks me a question, I should post it on a fact page and maybe it will write itself. But I often talk about bow ties off of major highs and lows. Well, that's a major sell signal or a major buy signal. For instance, in 2000, when the market bow tied down on a weekly basis, that was a major sell signal because it's coming off of all-time highs. Same thing happened in 2007, 2008. It came off of all-time highs and formed a bow tie very early in 08, late 07, late 07, early 08. Now, every now and then you'll get a signal in between where you're between that major high and major low. And those are worth paying attention to, but I don't get as excited about them as I do over signals that happen at major highs or lows. Now, to those of you who've been following me a while, you'll know that in 2015, early 2016, I did get a little bearish. And I think that's where some of these shorts have come from that were that came out of trading full circle 
But notice that the Russell 2000 made all-time highs, and then it made a bow tie to the downside. And this is why, I don't know if I want to say I was bearish back then, but I became concerned about the market, and we started putting on a few shorts. And the bow tie triggered. It wasn't a straight route lower, but eventually it did work its way lower after a little bit of sideways trading for nearly an 18% drop. Well, the media defines a bear market as a 20% drop. And peak to trough, it dropped more than 20% in 2015. So that's nothing to sneeze at. And that's, by media's definition, a bear market. And by the way, and I know I'm going to touch upon this in one second, but that's your buy and hold thing. So if you if you were long small cap stocks, you held through that 20% slide in the index, then chances are you threw caution to the wind and did not follow prudent money management. Over the short term, you might get rewarded. Over the intermediate term, to somewhat long term, you might get rewarded for that. But as I often preach, that'll work until it don't. Now, I'm not sure where I, I picked up this slide, but I think it was in a, in a presentation for somebody else. Big Dave's major top and bottom catcher and six easy steps. Wait for a major high or low. Wait for a, a bow tie or first thrust or one of those other transitional patterns. Trade the bow tie or first thrust. And then put a stop above or below one. Now, it might be hard to stomach a stop way up there, but... The point I'm trying to make is a lot of times that becomes the ultimate high. And that'll make more sense when we go through this. And, of course, practice proper money management. If you're not stopped, make sure that you go in and take partial profits and trail a stop. And then enjoy. So this is what that looks like. If you go back to, and I'd forgotten what chart this is, a weekly S&P. Going way back in time. There's your all-time high. There's your boats high. There's your setup. And I know it seems like a long ways away, but if you could stomach it, your stop would be above that all-time high. And even if you're not trading it, let's just say, you're like, okay, why well, don't trade the indices? I'm not a big fan of trading the indices in and of themselves, by the way, because they tend to be efficient. Every now and then, I'll step in and make a trade. But for the most part, I'd rather trade individual stocks. So let's say you're trading individual stocks. We pay attention to this. It's like, aha, we got a trigger and a sell signal until and unless the old highs get taken out. In other words, the market goes on to make new highs. Unless this happens, this signal remains in effect. And I'm going to show you a few markets in just one second where the ultimate top was confirmed with that bow tie and never exceeded. And I would urge you to go out and do the same thing when it comes to markets. Go in and look for those bow ties. Go look at bonds. Go look at Forex, which we have an example of both in just one second. Go look at indices. And you're going to be amazed that sometimes you'll get like a weekly bow tie off of all-time highs. And that those all-time highs are never exceeded afterwards. So this is a Forex example. I do remember taking this original trade, and then I took the second lost, and then I took the second trade and did pretty good. And this is euro versus dollar, or euro or dollar. But you can see you have a bow tie here. It's also what I call a second mouse signal. And I didn't come up with that name. I forget who, where I got it from, but it's not my original thought. But the early bird gets the worm, the second mouse gets the cheese type of setup. And then this is bonds, like I mentioned earlier. It wasn't a route lower, but you can see that over time, they worked their way lower. So even if you're not trading bonds, but you want to know where things are going from a macro perspective, well, you know that interest rates are going up based on that top in bonds. And again, after an all-time high. Now, I'm often asked, hey, Dave, can I use it on an hourly chart? Yeah. Can I use it on a weekly chart? Yeah. Can I use it on a daily chart? Yeah. <laughs> and as I've said often, recently we had a hourly Landry's bow tie. This is the S&P 500 off of all time highs. 
So when a market makes all-time highs, it pays to pay attention. In Forex, this is what I like to do. I actually do trade Forex, even though it's an efficient market. Read the special report on efficiency on my website. It's, on, it's in the store. You have to, as I often say, you have to walk through the gift shop to get to the free stuff. But it's at the bottom of the store. And read the re article about that I wrote on that. And, and the, when it comes to efficient markets like indices or bonds or Forex, commodities, they still can make inefficient moves, but you have to pick your spots very carefully. So one way to pick your spots carefully is to wait for something like an hourly bow tie for major highs or major lows. And that's what I like to do in Forex. You don't get a lot of trades. You have to be really patient, but that's okay. I don't want to be in and out like a madman. I don't want to be like that rat hitting the button for the cocaine, you know. <laughs> I had a business associate once, you know, I'm on the phone with him. And we we're working on a project together. And all of a sudden he's like, ah, I'm like, oh, what's, you know, somebody coming to your house, got a gun in your head. He's like, ah, ah. it's like, well, he was sitting there watching the screen and cussing and fussing the whole time. Whereas I'm like, eh. Trying not to look at my screens because, yeah, I know I'll drop an F-bomb or two, but there's no sense to go through all those emotions. But I will come in and trade something like an hourly. And even in a case like this, I mean, this is many, 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 many days if you took this trade. You didn't have to micromanage it and sit there and watch every little zig and zag. And in Forex, sometimes I might stay long a pair for a month or more off an hourly signal. So it's not like you're in and out, in and out, in and out. Anyway, so that's the fractal nation, nature. And by the way, all major tops or bottoms will have a transitional pattern. It could be a bow tie at first thrust, reversal gap strategy, or something else. All right, a couple of random thoughts. This is a slide I've left in here for a while, and I added a question mark. Because last summer we had some issues, and then the market improved, and then obviously now we really have some issues. So I added a question mark to that, not just yet. And I'm going to flesh that out here in just one second. In fact, let's do that now. I have another slide that ties back in some of the prior stuff. I don't know where that is. We'll get to it in one minute, I guess. Um, as I've been saying lately, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave Light. And Dave Light simply the lows are below downside Dave Light, the moving average. And then we'll just go through this quickly because I'm going through this every week. And if you want to go back several weeks, you can get a lot more information on this. But the green illustrates, doesn't indicate, illustrates when there is positive daylight or upside daylight, meaning that the Lows are greater than the moving average. Yeah, the 50 day, this is the 50-day moving average or 50-week moving average, 50 period, however you want to look at it. Okay, so you can see you have in this last run since we had since 2009 up until 2016, which we just talked about, up until this area here, which for all intents and purposes was pretty much a bear market in the Russell 2000. You had green or upside daylight during that whole period of time on a weekly chart. And then we had a little downside daylight. And then so far, and if you go back, well, when we get to live charts, I'll zoom it in. But so far, we're still, albeit barely, above that moving average. So this is just counting the number of days, okay? It's not magnitude. So even though price is closing in on a moving average down here, it's going to continue to go higher as long as price stays above that moving average. So from a longer term, big picture perspective, we're still in a bull market. But when we drill down a little bit, as we will here in just one second, it certainly pays to pay attention at this juncture. Now, in prior weeks, and I just updated this chart a few minutes ago, but in prior weeks, I talked about the fact that we could be in the process of making a process type of top versus an event. So if this market begins to crash, the media is going to call it a crash and get all excited about the crash. But 
we know that it's been rolling over for a long, long time. And if you go back to prior presentations, I talked a lot about the net net. We could do this on the live charts too, but you could see where was the S&P in November, 2,600. Where was the S&P yesterday, 2,600. So let's see, what's that? One, two, three, four, five months of no forward progress. Yeah, some zigs and zags in between, but on a net net basis, what has the market done? Five months of sideways action. Now, the moving average only matters when it matters. I should say the 200, the 50, and the 200, okay? And I know I've got some clients who are big fans of the of these moving averages, especially the 50. And I only plot these averages when I think it matters. And right now is one of those times where it matters. Now, these are simple moving averages. And the only reason I have them plotted is because they are well watched. And you could see that the 50-day moving average has moved down, okay, or turned down in earnest. So what's happening is, if you understand the drop-off effect, is we're adding in prices down here, and we're dropping off prices up here. So that moving average is beginning to act a little bit more like an exponential moving average. It's beginning to catch up with price. Um, I'm going to give you the link here in one second, but if you don't have, if you haven't watched it, watch the first four free videos of Trading Full Circle. And I think in that I talked about exponential moving averages and how price turns down as soon as the price goes below it. And that's something I learned again from Greg Morris, who's a plethora of knowledge. Now, Death Cross, and I've done a presentation or two about this. Death cross simply means that the 50 goes below the 200. If you try to sell every time it went below and buy every time it went above, there might be a tiny, tiny, tiny edge. My friend Rob Hanna, I think, says he might have said 4% at one point. I'll have to ask him what the edge is. But it's very, very, very minuscule, not worth trading in the least. Okay? But. The magnitude of the move, as I did in the prior presentation, is pretty damn impressive. So let's say you get a death cross, okay? Well, let's say whatever this day is, sometimes you'll get a sell-off that looks like this. And, yeah, by the time the price has crossed back up, you might have made that 1% or 2% or even lost money on the trade. But if this thing drops 50% in the meantime, okay, that's a pretty serious move lower. So don't look at the pure statistics of the death cross. And I'm sure I'll dust off that old presentation and do it again if I can find it. Where I took the statistics of the pure pattern and looked at the magnitude of the moves. And that's what's important. So I'm just trying to help you guys and girls get ahead of this. I tr trust me. I don't. I don't watch the business channel, but trust me. If we do get a so-called death cross, the media is going to go ape shit, and you're going to hear a lot about it. Just don't get too excited. Just continue. To just plot along. Now, one thing's kind of interesting. I think it was Gary Kaulbaum. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it sounds like something he would say. He said that the price was, in one of his newsletters, when the price was above the 200-day moving average but below the 50-day moving average, he called that no man's land. And I didn't have enough time to research this, and I don't know when I'll get around to doing it, so this might be fodder for your research. But you might want to go in and look at what happens when markets are stuck between those two moving averages. I think it would be kind of an interesting research project. But I kind of get what he's saying. It's kind of like, eh, are you in an uptrend? Are you a downtrend? It's just chop it around. It's probably just chop it around. And you probably want to be cautious when you're in that so-called, or Gary called, no man's land. Now, getting back to the concept of daylight, the 200-day moving average has held. There's nothing magical about the 200-day moving average or any moving average for that matter. But the concept of, 
concept of daylight can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So you'll notice during this nice long last leg we've been in, there was upside daylight, meaning that the lows were greater than the 200-day moving average, except for this one little tiny kiss here. But now the upside daylight has evaporated. There's no more upside daylight, at least for now. So if you're using that as your metric to keep you on the right side of the market, then doesn't mean you should bail out right now, but it ne you need to be cautious because you no longer have that upside daylight. A couple of random thoughts on the market. Remember, if we do get a death cross, it's not the death cross in and of itself, the signal in and of itself, but it's what happens in between. Okay, so it's not the signal, it's what happens afterwards, or I should say in between signals. And you certainly don't want to sit around and wait until you get the, the death cross back up. The golden cross is what they call that to cover your shorts. Uh, be really careful not to join the church of what's happening now. I have to find the, the link, but I noticed Greg Morris tweeted out a link, one of his classical um, pieces. Or he updated one of his classical pieces, I should say. And it kind of dovetails in. I don't want to sound like, yeah, Greg, I said that too. But it's a lot of what I say. Like if you if you notice a market starts doing this, if a market's trending and you're a trend follower and all of a sudden it's oscillating and now you're an oscillated trader or reversion to the mean trader, you can't do that because you'll end up chasing your own tail. And that's kind of the crux of his article. But he, he says it a lot more eloquently than I do. Easy for me to say a big word. What's that for, Solomon? And the problem is, it's like a hindsight bias. It's like, well, yeah, as he said, too, it's like, well, the market's been oscillating since January, but you didn't know it was oscillating until more recently, okay? So you got to be really careful to, uh, what's the old saying? Uh, is it plot your curves and draw your, no. What's that old saying? It's, it shows you I was not in engineering. Plot your curves and then draw your equations. Uh, be careful because it's never different this time. Yeah, we had, you can go back to 2000, like I just said, and we had some pretty ugly corrections in there, which should have shaken you out as a trend follower. But if you continue to follow along and you're feeling brilliant, just keep in mind that it's never different this time, okay? Markets will be markets. Yes, you might not have gotten stopped out before or the market didn't tank before, but sooner or later, it will. And this is a, I was, I've been cleaning up my old columns, and then I'm also working on a, um, to enhance the member's experience on my website. And I have a lot more to say about that really soon. I need to clone myself. But by accident, I found this, which came from investing with the trend from Judd Dotery over at, uh, I hope I'm saying his name right, at, uh, Stadium Capital. He said active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who's kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned. I talk about money managers because they likely have not made any moves that would or will protect their portfolio when the next inevitable bear market control occur. So it's like you got an error or two in there. But you get the idea. So if you're trading, let's say you're trading a trend following system and the market just goes up, 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 and up, and there's a few zigzags in between where you should have gotten stopped out, but you didn't take them, you didn't take those, uh, you didn't honor your stops and you just stayed long, well, you look like a genius. So that's what Mr. Dotery is saying that you should question anyone who does well, extremely well, in markets like that. Just the opposite of what you would think. I, getting back to my early programming days, when I used to program a lot of systems, I remember when I programmed my first successful system, I got all excited. I was like, all right. Let me put some stops in there and see what happens. 
because performance looks fantastic. I'm going to throw some stops in there, a little money management, and my performance is going to get even better. Well, to my dismay, what happened was just the opposite. My profitable system became a losing system because the stops were taking me out of positions that eventually turned winner. So let's say I had a signal right here, okay? And then I had these abysmal drawdowns in between. Well, without stops, it's like from here to here, boy, that's a great system. You know, that's why you got to be careful with these system designers who are selling you a system and not actually trading them themselves. Because that looks like a beautiful trade, but in reality, you would have lost a lot of money in between and the drawdowns would be abysmal. So I quickly found out that stops are bad for profits. But wait, Dave, I thought you said use stops. I'm not saying don't use stops. What I'm saying is you have to use stops even though it might hurt your performance because sooner or later, the market will not come back. Okay, Phil says, hey, Phil. If I recall correctly, death and gold crosses do not test out with positive expectancy. As you say, what happens around them is more important. Around them is, Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, Rob Hanna tested them because he does quantify everything. In fact, he owns uh, Quantifiable Edges, the website. Uh, and he told me there's a slight, slight edge, and it's not anything to write home about, but it's what happens in between. I, I would imagine that bow ties do not test out. I mean, they're not designed to test out. Believe me. I mean, hopefully they work, but they're not designed to test out as a mechanical system. Okay, we'll get to that when we get to the get to the charts. Good question. Question about a stock with a bow tie. Okay, as I said a second ago, if you haven't already done so, start watching Trading Full Circle for free. And I guess I need to shorten this URL at some point in time. But if you go to 2 trade stocks successfully, a lot of the concepts of trend and trend following and stops and not buy and hold and all these things that I've been preaching kind of as an underlying base to today's presentation or in those first four videos. Pretty good if I say so myself. They're not teaser videos. They are the actual first four videos from the course. Somebody a while back who eventually got the course was like, hey, I was surprised that those first four lessons were actually lessons and not some sort of teasing. It's like, well, that's how I roll. All right, let's take a look at the live charts. And before we do that, because it relates to the stocks, OLED bow tie. Okay, let's take a look at that. It's timely. All right, let's put the bow ties in. Okay. Yeah, this one would have been a little hard to get in, though. Okay, and this is kind of that double top looking thing. It's all, it's pretty beautiful. Let's take a look at this. So technically, your bow tie would not have occurred. Nope, right here. Yeah, you would have taken a little heat, though, obviously. Okay, but, but getting back to what I said earlier, your, your top was never taken out. Not that you want to put a stop way up here if you're getting entering down here for a swing trade, swing to intermediate term trade. But yeah, there was your bow tie right there. Beautiful. Okay. Notice it was kind of a double top where this top just kind of overshot this top. Triggers a bow tie, a little throwback move. Remember, markets will do what they have to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And they'll also... Do the obvious in an unobvious manner. This stock looked like it was tanking. So what does it do first? It has a little throwback against the trend. Okay. Yeah, if you guys want to start asking about individual uh, stocks, feel free to do so. All right, you want to talk and you want to look at the death cross on this one? All right, let me clean the chart up. And let's put in a 200-day moving average. And then let's throw in a 50-day moving average. One time I got bored in a presentation and I put in a 500 day moving average and I was looking at daylight. And that's a pretty amazing thing. Obviously, you're going to have some abysmal drawdowns, but it's kind of cool. 
Yeah, I mean, by the time you sit around and wait for that death cross to happen, you've missed most of the move. But it is. It's worth watching when it's worth watching, especially in a process type of top like we might be having in S&P, at least for now. All right, let me just uh, – I think we kind of beat the dead horse on the S&P. Let's just take a look real quickly at where we are now in the live charts. And then we'll take a look at the NASDAQ and the Dow, and then we'll have plenty enough time to get to your questions on individual stocks. The P's are having a decent day. So far, bounced off the 200-day moving average. Again, nothing magical about that, blah, blah, blah. I don't see any reason to rush out and take a whole lot of action. I might look to initiate a new short or two, although our shorts really haven't paid off yet. And, you know, by the way, your own portfolio is a good litmus test of how things are going. On, go, uh, how things are going. If, you, if you're not catching long, um, so if you're not making money, then you don't necessarily want to add on new positions unless you think you have the mother of all positions. So that's the ebb and flow of your portfolio thing that I often talk about. NASDAQ Composite looks a little dubious in here, okay? We do have a daily bow tie here, okay? We didn't actually have one back here. But we do have one working now, and it actually triggered a couple days ago. So if we're looking at the moving averages, on this day here, the 10 is... Less than a 20, and a 20 is less than a 30. What is that? That's a bow tie. Right here on this day here, we have a higher high and a higher low. What happens next? Let's zoom in a little bit so we can really see it. Well, you would have gotten a short signal on this day, okay? It didn't really pay off hugely yet. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it won't. I hope it won't. I hope the market goes straight back up. We get stopped out of the shorts and we just get long and stay long forever. That would be an ideal world. But we do have to pay attention. Oh, by the way, as I said last week in the S&P 500, we had a first thrust down. I wrote about this in Proactive Advisor magazine. The editor asked me, would you, gotten, would you have lost money in the whipsaw? It's like, well, if you took profits, you would have scratched out. But when you have a sell signal, that signal remains in effect until and unless the old highs are taken out. Doesn't mean that you necessarily made money on a trade, but it means the top remains in place until proven otherwise. Okay. Let's take a look at the Rusty. So NASDAQ Composite, by the way, let's get back to that one more time. So, yeah, the top of the NASDAQ remains in place until and unless we make new highs. Now, I was looking at old articles last night, and I remember talking about let's just sit and wait, see if the market can go back to new highs. And somebody's like, but Dave, what about between here and the old highs? What do we do between here and the old highs? And I'm like, nothing. It's You can't say, well, I'm going to catch every zig and zag in the market. I mean, unless you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, go for it. But... It's okay to wait for the market to prove itself. It's okay to be in show me mode. So when the market starts making bow ties down or first thrust down or moving average start crossing, whatever metric you want to use, you don't have to use Big Dave's patented secret sauce stuff. It's not secret because I'm public with it all. <laughs> I, there's nothing proprietary that I do, believe me. I... Everything is, is fully disclosed. Now, some things you have to pay for, such as some of the moving average, I'm sorry, some of the bow tie, pat, bleh, some of the IPO patterns and some stuff in trading full circle and stock selection and all. But everything is fully disclosed. There's no secret indicator. And you don't want to trade anyone who is a proprietary indicator because they might get hit by a beer, uh, a beer truck and then you're going to be screwed. But that's another conversation altogether. Russell 2000. Now, by the way, the Russell 2000 did bow tie down when the P's bow tied down, and that top remains in place until and unless this high here gets taken out, okay? Now, Russell 2000, kind of all over the place, as you can see, kind of electrocardiogram. Let's go back to October to now. So now we know it's trading sideways. Now, you can't say... Oh, back here it's trading sideways or whatever, and then it goes on to make new highs. But looking in perfect hindsight, you can see it's trading sideways. So 
we might want to mostly sit on our hands now that we have identified the fact that it's mostly trading sideways. So it's like you got to be careful to not say things in hindsight. So when the market looks a little iffy, I try to point it out as quickly as possible so people can't say, oh, Dave, sure you called the bear market. It's down 50%. It's like, no, we were worried about the market in late 2007. We were worried about the market in early, fairly early 2018, where we are now. All right, sector action, nothing much to report. A lot of areas like the market, brick and mortar areas and some areas like drugs did a bit of a retrace and so far have fallen out of that retrace rally. A lot of areas like technology, like the NASDAQ itself, and I've been beating a dead horse on this. No need to, to go to town on that, but broke out to new highs. Yay, everything's great, and then it rolled right back over. So that action is a little bit concerning. Bonds have rallied a little bit last few days notwithstanding, but that's a good thing. When the market was sliding, at least bonds were going up. That means that the baby wasn't getting thrown out with the bathwater, old Wall Street adage. But very important thing to watch. If you see gold going down, bonds going down, stocks going down, and the rest of the and other commodities going down, then you might want to pay attention. And again, in most sectors, technology is going to look a lot like the overall market. Anything more brick and mortar, uh, technology overall market vis-a-vis -vis the NASDAQ. Anything brick and mortar, material construction, or transports, banks, are going to look a lot like the S&P 500, a little stalling on a retrace rally. All right, let's bang out these stocks real quick. MBII. Okay, well... It's obviously headed higher, but there's no setup there, okay? And it looks like a big fat bottom when you go way back in time. Oops. Okay. So if you want to put it on your watch list, that's fine. It's a little bit on the volatile side, a little bit on the thin side, a little bit on the cheap side. But as a private trader, you can certainly go out and trade those things. But, yeah, on a pullback. Okay. CPSD, that's going to be capstone turbines or something, huh? Am I right? Yeah. One thing I don't like here is it's just barely taking out this prior peak in here. Let's back the chart out. But bottoming, you got a mountain of overhead supply to go through. I would pass until and unless and get past, let's say, a buck seventy-eight. So I would leave that one alone unless, again, it got past all this overhead supply. LGCY, I used to like. You got a little over at supply, but it's it's a ways away, both in time and uh, price. Now, the reason I say I used to like it was because it was accelerating, but now it's beginning to lose some steam, okay? So let's take a look at our net net price change. Well, that's 13%, but this is a HV of 70, 69, those keep it score. So that's a pretty serious HV. So for the most part, it's dropped significantly. Let's look at, I mean, look at how the stock normally moves. This is a normal personality stock, 60% move or 55.90 move, okay, in what, two weeks? So even a 13% move really isn't that much. So you can see, for the most part, it has lost quite a bit of steam in here as of late. So I would leave it alone based on that. Also, energy hasn't been doing that great. Well, there's really no sector except for maybe selected sporting goods or something very small, maybe a very small health service subsector. But for the most part, most areas aren't doing that great. So it's going to have to be the mother of all setups for me to get excited and take it. EC? No. No. You want to short this? What do you want to do with this? It's going sideways, okay? Never forget about the net net. So you go all the way back to when? January of 2018 to now, it's going absolutely sideways. So yeah, take that one off of your list. I mean, you could certainly keep it on a minimum list, but not until it bangs out new highs. And, again, energies aren't doing that great, so I don't see any reason to go after them. 
NIHD is going to be a semi, I think. Yeah, it's lost a little bit of steam as of late. Let's see what's going on here. Why do I have all these lines on the chart? Yeah, it's got some overhead supply to deal with. Lots and lots and lots of overhead supply. So even though it's back in 2016 and 2017, markets sometimes have long memories. Not enough time to get into uh, analyzing overhead supply, but just in this particular case, it's got a little overhead supply. Also, now don't get excited about the percentage move, okay? That, oh, Dave, it's 30%. Well, I mean, come on, the stock moves. Look, let's take a look at volatility here. That's a 70% move there in two days, three days, okay? HV is 156. So for all intents and purposes, especially if you look at it like highs, let's just draw a line over the highs. You can see it hasn't gone anywhere in quite a while. So I would pass on that one for a variety of reasons. Now, if you're new to the show, you're probably thinking, you hate all my picks. There's well, only one case that I can remember in years of doing the show where somebody brought me bad picks for a long, long time and then got offended and quit <laughs> coming to the shows. But right now is not one of those times. Right now, it's, there's not going to be much that I like. Even if you show me a great setup, I'm like, yeah, it looks great, but the market's iffy, sector's iffy. Let's just pass. So don't feel offended. Now, if you've been coming week after week and you're recommending stuff going sideways, then you might need to find something else to do if you claim to be a trend follower. Little overhead supply way back here. That's uh, four years ago. I'm not going to get too worried about it. Had this big gap down, as you can see. I'm not going to be too worried about it, but it is kind of in the back of my mind that the stock can trade a little erratically or can be erratic. It looks okay. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. It's okay. I just can't get that excited about it for those aforementioned reasons. And then now you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then too many days in the pullback, too. I mean, based on the magnitude of the move, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Maybe it had one knockout bar in here, give it one or two more days. But after that, I would pass. It needs to pull back a little bit more. Momo, 39. It's a little Katy Perry. What's that mean? It's a little Katy Perry. Momo, -mo, a little Katy Perry. I don't get the joke. Okay, this is below the prior peak in here. If you were trading a transition, it's not coming off of major, major lows. It's a little wide and loose longer term. So for me to get excited about stock, this stock would have to take out this prior high in here. She's up, she's down. <laughs> it's my old joke. Oh, I didn't, uh, did I ever say that joke? Well, that's a pretty good joke. I don't I didn't realize I use that. I say Jackie Mason sometimes, but uh, yeah, up in the air, down, up in the air, cool. I guess you don't want me singing that. Tesla for Mr. Phil. Let me guess. Throw the 50-day moving average in, and let's see where it is. No, it's a ways away from it. Um, Tesla looks like it's in a world of hurt. Unfortunately, you know, it's up and it's down. It's hot and it's cold. Um, I would pass, but I hear you. You know, for a swing trade, you certainly could do a lot worse. you got a gap down. You've got a tremendous amount of overhead supply. I don't like all this trading back here. We'll likely find some support, but I certainly hear you. And if all I was seeing was just this pattern here, this breakdown of this range, a little throwback to the range, I would say by all means, short it. <laughs> You've been around a long time, Big Dave. <laughs> yeah, I've even, I forget my old jokes, I guess. Pan W. Uh, put it on your momentum list. It's obviously not set up now, but yeah, put it on your momentum list. You know, the caveat is, uh, there's not a whole lot to get excited about in this market. Or I should say the market's not doing that great. Sector's not doing that great. The other problem that I have, not to pick apart everything or pick apart, pick apart everything to death, is that these stocks that are in these longer term uptrends could be priced for perfection if the market begins to crack. And then the other thing that could happen, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, let's just say in general the market's a little oversold now. Let's say the market begins to improve. Well, what happens is fund managers sometimes go after the stocks that got beaten up. And in order to buy those stocks, they sell stocks that have been doing well. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but I've seen it happen. So 
that's my only concern with some of these uh, longer term stocks. TSCO is a short. This one's a little wide and loose, and it's kind of, it's just all over the place. It's a Jackie, uh, what's her name? Oh, it's Jackie Mason. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. And then it's also a Katy Perry stock. Um, so I would pass. On the short side, you want to try to find something coming off of major highs as opposed to something that's bouncing around all over the place. You get caught up in a squeeze and then the bottom drops out. Uh, in, in reference to to shorting at low levels, yeah, if that's what you're saying. GBTC, we got a bad um, signal on a longer term trending stock. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with long longer term trending stock as as a trend follower, but they can become a source of funds. No, no, this is not. If you are a trend trader, then you would not buy this stock, and then it has a tremendous amount of red supply. So no, that's not, uh, that's not, if you, there's other IPOs out there that are nearing new highs that you should be looking at, as opposed to that one, okay? I'll give you a hint, one of them came public about five days ago, and I have it on a service today as an honorable mention. Uh, now, Adobe's just kind of all over the place and kind of sideways in here, it's lost some steam. So, again, something's going to have to knock my socks off for me to want to buy it, given the nature of the market. Not that we did it horse, but harsh is what my brother-in-law says, I say. Uh, no, this is going too far sideways, okay? You can see it's just barely making these new highs, barely above this high here. Um, put it on your momentum list, let it break out to new highs, and then reevaluate with all the caveats we just said about the potential uh, market action. RCM, did we talk about that one? I think we talked about this one. Yeah, we talked about that one. All right, we got time for one more. Anyone? Bueller. All right, here we go. Big commentary here. On SPX, counting today, the last three days are showing consecutive consecutive higher closes. It hasn't happened in a month. Last three days are an inside day, outside day, reversal up day, and today was a gap up. The last nine days appear to be consolidation, and today is close to a nine-day high. Probably too optimistic. Well, you with the gaps and all that other stuff, you probably want to look at the spiders because some of that analysis gets thrown out the window because you don't get a true open with S&P 500. Uh, one, two, this will be the third consecutive up day. I guess we have to wait to the end of the day. It's not really a gap. It's kind of a lap. It kind of overlaps here. Now, I just don't see anything to hang your hat on there and get that excited about, okay? But, yeah, ideally, deep down in my heart, I hope that we just have a uh, correction going on here, you know. And DBX, yeah, DBX is one of those uh, stocks. If you're going to trade a stock, trade something that's going to make new highs in an IPO. Yeah, that's one that's on my list to possibly keep an eye out for LGND. It's going to be a pharmaceutical. No, it's pulled back below its prior breakout, so leave that alone. Unless you want to short it. Uh, you talk about short side? Yeah, you could probably do a little better in a short side. It does look like it could be in trouble, but I'd leave that alone. TSCO, tractor supply. We talked about that one, Don. I thought we did. Yeah, we talked about that one a few minutes ago. Don must have asked about a stock and, and went to take a leak. Or did we? Yeah, we talked about that one. All right, looks like we're out of time. Uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, David, DaveLander.com. Quick answers will be replied to right away. Those requiring thought might take me a few days or we'll become fodder for the next show. Uh, as you can tell, I have a blast doing these things. As long as you guys and girls continue to show up, I will continue to do them. So thank you so much. If we don't talk again between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls back here next week. Thank you so much.